Welcome along to the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. John Hindhoff and the IMSA broadcast team are trackside for qualifying for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship here at Road America. Great to have your company on what is pretty much a picture perfect day. Coming up, we have 15 minute qualifying sessions. No real time to make any changes. And where are we? We're just outside Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin on a 14 corner, just over four mile circuit that has been here since the 1950s. Road racing was always a, a really big thing around these parts, but as cars got faster, racing on the public roads got more dangerous. And so it was decided to carve out a circuit in this green and pleasant land following the contours of the countryside that most closely resembled the local roads. And thus, Road America was created. We're on a little bit of a delay at the moment following a very nasty incident at the end of the Porsche race uh, involving a couple of cars separately, effectively. Uh, two accidents uh, occurring at pretty much the same time. One begat the other, uh, in fairness. And that was uh, uh, when one of our new drivers in Porsche in the number 69 car went into the wall. And Scott Wellham just squeezing by in the 61 but got on the grass and had his own accident, what, 150, 200 yards further down the road. Delighted to say that Messrs Hardy and Wellham both walked away from the cars. They've been taken for the uh, mandatory checkup but uh, I'm sure they will be pronounced fit. The cars, not so much. And Jeremy Shaw, there's a lot of work for their teams to do, which is exactly what you don't want on a busy race weekend. And the guys in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship will be hoping that they don't have any work to do. It's already been a busy weekend for a couple of the teams in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Yeah, it certainly has. Two teams working uh, pretty much through the night to get their cars ready for the practice session this morning. Those two Porsches, I can't see those being uh, repaired for tomorrow's race. And um, you've got to feel for Scott Wellham. He had a big crash also at Watkins Glen, wasn't able to compete in either race there. He crashed during practice. And that was another big impact. It tore wheels off the cars. And yeah, both those two cars, I think, uh, probably be on repair for the weekend. Park Place with Patrick Lindsay and Jörg Bergmeister. Good to have them back in the field in a on a circuit that uh, Jörg Bergmeister has been pretty successful in in the past. That's uh, a second Porsche to uh, race against uh, the, another Porsche rather, to race against the right motorsport cars. But Jörg Bergmeister, incredibly, five victories here down through the years. Sorry, four uh, down through the years here. A um, couple of those prepared with one of the drivers in the uh, 58 Porsche, of course. Pat Long, they made a, a great champion. One of the real success stories is the Ben Keating and Jerome Blake all in number 33. That car has literally been rebuilt. That is not the same shell, not the same chassis that started off the weekend. Ben Keating with a brand new pair of driving boots slipped, foot slipped off the brake going down the hill through Harry Downs into turn number eight, the tricky left-hander, and then got stuck between brake and throttle. Couldn't get the car stopped, hit the wall very hard indeed no spare cars allowed to be rolled out but what you can do is transfer the bits from the car that has the damaged chassis into a new chassis and that's exactly what the riley team have done this weekend and ben keating who was fine after that a little perhaps his pride a little dented as well as more than that on the car he will be qualifying that car this afternoon, that's the number 33. And for the other GTD qualifiers, let's take a Continental Tire Pit Lane update from Shea Adam. Already done the 33, so I will skip that one. Uh, let's go for the, th the two cars ahead of that in the championship chase. So far, it is Madison Snow, who will be piloting the 48 Paul Miller Racing Championship leading Lamborghini. They are in the first GTD slotted pit box. It will be Catherine Legg in the 86 Acura and Justin Marks in the 93, so the two MSR entries with the two normal starting drivers. As you mentioned, Ben in the 33. It's Cooper McNeil driving the number 63 Scuderia Course Ferrari, so he will be going out to qualify on what is closest to his home track. 
Robbie Foley in the number 96 Turner Motorsports BMW. He has had a lot of track time so far this weekend. Clearly is a good grip on that blue and yellow BMW. He'll be going for pole in that car. It is David Hedemeyer Hansen who is getting the qualifying responsibilities, as he told us a little bit earlier on on MC Radio, for the number 15 Lexus. And although it looks like it's Super Mario Farmbacher in the number 14 Lexus, it is Dominic Bauman just wearing a different helmet this weekend. John Potter will take the number 44 Magnus Racing Audi out onto the track. And it will be Patrick Lindsay, a guy who's gotten pole here in the not too distant past in the number 71 Park Place Porsche. Francesco Piovanetti in the number 51 Spirit of Race Ferrari. And I saved the biggest surprise for last, John. Our pole sitter at Lime Rock was Patrick Long, and he is the one qualifying the 58 Wright Motorsport Porsche. That actually doesn't surprise me. Uh, they're uh, felt they were owed a little bit more from that race. Um, Patrick's pace fell off at the end, had a tyre issue that they just couldn't engineer their way around. And I, I think Pat wants to put that car as far up the grid as possible. I think he'll probably start as well and have uh, Christina Nielsen do uh, the second stint. And uh, he'll be looking to gap, put a gap on the rest of the field beautiful weekend here perhaps a little warm for the race cars and anybody else who's in multi-layered uh, fireproof suits camping all around the circuit in what is a world-class facility and of all the tracks that we go to in the u.s uh, this is the one i think that would be uh, by far the simplest to turn into a grade one fia circuit a few places where the runoff would have to be looked at and you'd have to build a pit complex but other than that i think this would make a fantastic grade one circuit and i know it's been talked about in the past and there's still more improvements to go top three in the championship go out one two and three with the 48 lamborghini then madison snow giving the qualifying duties and then the great Accurate, Catherine Legg in the 86. She is second in the championship, so she's been given qualifying duties here. Alvaro Parent, her teammate, again this weekend. Remember, Alvaro, um, not on the same point as Catherine because he wasn't able to join her at Detroit for the Belle Isle Grand Prix, which she won. Uh, Alvaro, it's a, it's a convoluted story, but we have time before we get some laps in here. That 86 car was only slated to do the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Championship this year, but they had such a good start to the season and was in championship contention that uh, MSR, I had a chat with Michael Shank yesterday up at Marion's and he was in pretty good form, to be honest. Well, they found some extra money for the 86 and entered it into the early June race at Belle Isle. Unfortunately, Alvaro, having thought that uh, that wasn't going to be on his US schedule, had a clashing engagement, and that's why he wasn't there. Now, subsequently, with Catherine right in the championship hunt, the sponsorship team at MSR have gone into overdrive and have now confirmed of weeks ago now confirmed that that 86 car is in for the rest of the season so it will give a genuine challenge to the 48 Lamborghini heading down towards Canada corner now the red black and silver car of Madison Snow and Brian Sellers and in fairness the Paul Miller team very happy about that almost as happy but probably not quite as Catherine Legg and the rest of the 81 uh, 86 squad they do want competition and Brian Sellers who's been in this booth a few times the IMSA broadcast booth was uh, strongly saying we want to race somebody on the track it would be a shame if that car doesn't run the rest of the championship and they've got their wish 33 car looked like they might have been in contention but didn't have a great race uh, Blake Amolan and Ben Keating at Lime Rock Park looked like they were having a worse weekend here but that car was very quick in the final practice session third quickest for that car and I still and I think still third in the championship those two uh, yep. Jeremy although they dropped back a bit didn't they yeah they dropped a little bit uh, last time out but uh, Brian Sellers and Madison Snow they uh, extended their lead with the win last time out at Lime Rock Park so it's now 
10 points between themselves and Catherine Legg coming into this weekend. Ben Keating and Jerome Blakeham another 14 points back, but just sterling work overnight to get number 33 car back onto the track for this morning. And, uh, and the car was fast right out, right out of the box. I mean, first flying lap, Jerome Blakeham was underneath the old uh, lap record here, which uh, I expect to get beat this afternoon. It's, it's a little bit warmer now, excuse me, than it was uh, when the cars were out for practice earlier on this morning, but the uh, benchmark time in GTD, the pole position last year, was taken by Lamborghini, by the way, changed racing as Jerome Mool one year ago, a 206.649. That, by the way, is an average speed in excess of 115 miles an hour. It's not hanging about, is it? No. Dominic Bauman leaves the pit lane last. Uh, actually doesn't because Jack Horsworth is still sitting in the pit lane. The two Lexus waiting for their opportunity to pull out. Well, ba Bauman is out in the 14. Hawksworth still showing in the pit lane on the timing screen. Maybe just rolling at the moment. So the red car may oh, I can't see the red car on the pit lane. Actually, Shea Adam, is Jack Hawksworth still on the pit lane? Has he not come out from behind the wall yet? Uh, no, th I think the car was out from behind the wall when I walked down that way. Um, the problem is that we've got the GTLM cars and the prototype cars sitting on the pit ah, lane. so it could be hiding. But if I stick my neck out a little bit, I don't see it on the pit lane. Uh, it would have to be tucked up really close behind the Penske Acura number six if it's on the pit lane. I'll let you uh, investigate that as we talk about the early times coming in. Madison Snow first out, therefore first to put in a time, a 207.780. Dominic Bauman on his outlap, very quick in the first sector. In fact, he's just gone through and starts his first flyer and it is a, going to be a very good one from Bauman he's on it straight away what lap time should we be looking for here Jeremy uh, <coughs> two minutes six point six was the lap record set one year ago Patrick Lindsay coming through Canada corner and climbing climbing and then climbing some more as he comes to the final 14th corner, the right-hander uses a bit of the kerb on the exit. Oh, a little bit too much of the kerb, drops the Continental tyres onto the dust. That'll have caught Patrick's attention, trying to get the best exit possible, crosses the line. Now, and heads down towards the first corner. Fastest time in uh, practice was set this morning by Jörg Bergmeister in that number 73 Park Lane Park Place Motorsports Porsche at a 206.427. Just fractionally ahead of uh, Patrick Long. Those two, of course, driving different cars this weekend, but uh, twice have set on, onto the top step of the podium right here at Road America when they shared the same car in 2005 and six. Yeah, a formidable partnership, those two, weren't they? Well, the first two minutes, six, goes to the Lexus driver, Dominic Bauman, on his first flying lap. Two minutes, 6.8, and pulls himself to a second ahead of the rest of the field. That's a sterling effort from Dominic Bauman on his first flying lap. Cooper McNeil in the black and white WeatherTech Ferrari. That's a car that has shown a bit of pace in the last couple of races. Another new co-driver for Cooper this weekend. Alessandro Pergidi added to the list of talent that includes last time out Gunnar Jeanette and of course throughout the season we've also had Alessandro Balzan and Jeff Siegel, all of the above still here this weekend as Patrick Long goes to the top at a 206.593 so that is a new uh, qualifying lap record there for Patrick Long looking to do the same uh, for the second race in succession who's also on the pole at Lime Rock problem for the 51 Ferrari Piovanetti has yeah. caused a red flag and we've only had seven and a half minutes. So at the moment, this is not a session that will count for times. Not an official session. Need another three minutes of that. Now, he's gone off at Canada Corn, uh, I think. Was that? 
Yes, it is Canada Corner. Turn 12. Uh, the Snatch Tractor is on its way out. That gives me a chance to take a, an update for from our Continental Tire Pit Lane reporter on that number 15 Lexus, Shea Adam. It was an engine problem for the 15 Lexus that caused them to miss this session. They knew it when they came out of the third practice. And whether they changed it after qualifying or then before the race started, either way, they were going to be starting at the back. Uh, no retardation from Francesco. Pianetti. Pianetti, uh just went straight on at relatively unabated speed. The gravel trap has pretty much done its job. There has been a collision with the right front of that Tricolore 51 Ferrari and the tyre wall, but nowhere near as bad as it would have been without the gravel trap to take some of the energy out of the car. Sort of tried to make the corner, but wasn't a real effort, Jeremy, and that's a very odd-looking accident there. Yeah, it was, rather. Yeah, very strange. I mean, he'd done, he'd done what a couple of laps already, so uh, should have been up to speed. But it certainly, it certainly seemed to be carrying too, way too much speed going into the corner. That was a very lo odd looking accident. But it, you know, it's not kind of buried in the tyres. It hasn't sort of jumped over uh, up as if it, if it, you know, if it didn't slow down at all. Then uh, I don't know. Very strange. Clock has still running. Five and a half minutes to go. And this is going to be touch and go as well as the, whether we get another two and a half minutes in to make this an official session. Approximately two and a half minutes. Need to have uh, Pat Long into the pit lane along with everyone else. Shea Adam is down in the pit lane. Remember when we had a red flag in qualifying, I think it was back at Sebring at, in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge. Uh, we had a couple of cars go straight to the pit out. They we did not come back that. to their pit boxes. You can't do that. And then they had to serve drive through penalties. Yes. We have two cars in line, John. The championship leading Lamborghini of Madison Snow and the 63 Ferrari of Cooper McNeil. And at this place, when it is a four mile lap, that is critical. Good spot, Shea. Very good spot. Uh, out into the pit lane, confusing me for a moment. The uh, number 67 Porsche GT, uh, Porsche Ford's GT, uh, drives out for its session, which will be coming up next for GT LM. And I, that just caught my eye, and I thought, oh, uh, and then I realised, of course, he hadn't been out on the track. He'd just come out from the holding area and into his pit lane. The good news is that the Snatch Tractor has extricated the fifth one Ferrari from the gravel it's now on tarmac again on asphalt there's damage to the right front and will that car fire and move it looked like it pulled out reasonably well yes it's fired and there's some bodywork damage to the right front of that car oh dear it's not how it came out of Maranello no, but it's a lot better than uh, than it could have been. C car you know, given the speed that he appeared to be carrying into the corner, could have been a lot Nasty worse than that. Nasty moment, that for the driver, I would have thought. Yeah, that no, wouldn't have been a lot of fun at all. Right front wing, fender, and probably the front end as well. Or oh, actually, down the door as well. Uh, that, that Okay, that's not going to look pretty, that Ferrari, but I'm sure they'll get it back out. There's a bit of rubbing on the front yeah, not right. For not for this qualifying, they weren't. Oh uh, no, 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 no! But for the for race, that. at least, yeah. And uh, we've got, you know, we've got a, a fighting chance here of, of getting these extra couple or so minutes in, to make the session official. It's going to be all down to how quickly <laughs> they it's clear the uh, vehicles from the area of the accident. Yeah, it, you know, it, d it didn't drag any any significant amount of gravel back on. Great flag. Track. However, as he was driving it out there, he certainly uh, deposited a bit from the undercarriage of the car. 2.49 on the clock when the green flag came out and those cars that were uh, waiting at the pit exit have been held so their penalty will be a drive through and waiting until everyone else goes out so that they couldn't just whiz round, get in and now they're being waved away so that is a bad mistake yep. from Madison Snow and from Cooper McNeil in respectively the 48 Lamborghini and the 63 black and white uh, Ferrari. They're certainly not going to have time to uh, complete this no. lap, serve a drive through and get back out, out again no. to complete another 
flying lap. Um, so uh, with now just two minutes remaining. Well, everybody's going to have to hustle to get across, the, get across the line and get one more. Indeed so, indeed so. And I mean hustle. You can't be hanging about here. There's 151 on the clock now. So the, the Catherine good, Legg is out there. The, the good news is you know, they, ha they have got a time in the books. They, they didn't cause a red flag, so they're not going to get any times taken away from them. So they have just got to hope that uh, there's enough gravel down there on the track in the first last couple of corners to deposit it as the number 51 car was driving back to the pits that the track isn't as in as good shape as, as it was before and that no one will be able to improve. Madison Snow currently third on the timing charts. Well, it's going to be touch and go whether we had the full 10 minutes to make it an official session, but it is 10 minutes. We've checked that with the officials. You need 10 of the 15 to make the times that are set count. Otherwise, it's grid position set by championship order. It's close. I, I looked up at the screen when the red flag came out and it was about 7.29, 7.30, something like that. So, yeah. yeah. And Halfway it was 2.49 when we went green again. So, you know, I'm, I'm by no means official. I'm you know, it's going to be close. Well, Catherine Legg will get another lap with 30 seconds to spare as she goes across the start-finish line and down towards turn one. There goes the two transgressors, but they'll have to do a drive-through. And, of course, they can't now do a drive-through, so I reckon they'll do this lap and then come into the pit lane, but that lap won't count. In fact, Madison Snow. Under discussion whether they'll have to do a drive-through. Hmm, OK. And there goes Madison Snow, just gets through. And now the chequered flag comes out. The chequered flag is out now. So Madison Snow did get through, having dropped all the way to the back of the line. And the Mercedes, uh, uh, check that, the Ferrari did get ahead of Madison. And Cooper McNeil wanted the space in front of him into the pit lane the 93 Acura didn't get round so has peeled into the pit lane and has seen the chequered flag there minimum time has been met I'm being told that's coming through on the race radio channel so Very this good. is an official session so if Catherine Legg can improve she will be better than the seventh place she occupies at the moment and Madison Snow for the moment we have to see what penalty might be applied to the 63 and the 48 because they haven't done their drive-through. Right, the 58 and the 14, the top two cars, did not go back out again. I think that's reasonable. They were happy with what they had. Very difficult to go out there in a one-lap scenario. Catherine Legg loses the front end of the 86 and just stays out of the gravel at Canada Corner. She was on the ragged edge there, trying to improve from seventh position, second in the GT Daytona Championship for that Grey multicoloured car and for Catherine Legg, confirmed with a couple of Xfinity, NASCAR Xfinity races uh, earlier on this week. Patrick Lindsay is on the good lap here. He's gone uh, blue, which is a personal best in each of the first two sectors in the park place Porsche car number 73. Catherine Legg now she across the checkered, la uh, no. checkered flag. No improvement from Catherine. Here comes Pat Patrick Lindsay across the line. He jumps up into fourth position in car number 73. Ben Keating also did improve. Yes. He's sixth. Catherine Legg, seventh. Robbie Foley, eighth for BMW. John Potter, ninth. Justin Marks, tenth. Yep. That's how it stands at the moment. Here comes the 48. Madison Snow, third position. Doesn't improve. Cooper McNeil did, though, up to fourth. Cooper McNeil up into fourth position with a 2073. So Cooper McNeil, who got ahead of Madison Snow on the outlap. Now, that remains to be seen whether any penalty is applied to Cooper McNeil for not going to his pit stall, similarly for Madison Snow, and whether they'll be allowed to keep their fast laps. Now, in Madison Snow's yep. case, that was done before Correct. the transgression. In Cooper McNeil's, it was done after. And we've seen drive-throughs applied when that has happened in the past. We await official confirmation, and Shea Adam will be on that one. But a chance to speak to Patrick Long in a few moments' time, who's our first of three pool sitters.
that we'll be setting this afternoon. Excellent job by Pat Long. Yeah, an excellent job also for Ben Keating there. Oh, in yes. That, in that number 33 car, fifth position it's looking like at the moment, uh, depending on whether Cooper McNeil keeps his time. Uh, but uh, really, uh, that was a, a great effort. But most, all, I think most, just about everybody improved their lap time on that final lap. And Madison Snow missed his by fractions of a second. Catherine Legg uh, also didn't didn't improve with, with that off at the at Canada Corner, but everybody else did improve their lap time. Let's uh, have a quick chat with uh, Shea Adam. The 58 car has fired up and is heading down towards her at the moment. Pat Long on his way to you, and the other question, of course, we need to have answered is what about that time from Cooper McNeil done after he'd been held at pit out having not called back to his pit boxes, which is what you have to do when answering a chequered flag. Shea Adam with his Continental Tire pit lane report and our pole sitter in GT Daytona, Patrick Law for Wright Motorsport. A great roar of the engine as he shuts the car off. Patrick coming back up to the penalty box. He goes from having no pole positions from IMSA for a very long time to all of a sudden getting two. So uh, a very successful couple of weekends for Patrick. Looking for a little bit of that unfinished business, though, after the race last weekend. Pole is just the beginning. It's nice to start on the front row. Give Pat an opportunity to take his helmet off and walk over to the backdrop. <laughs> Throws this helmet into the seat. For Patrick, this is uh, it's going to be a, an extra special pole position because Porsches this weekend have been wearing an extra decal on them. And uh, for Patrick Long, I, I know that the decals on your cars uh, with Dave Mirage's memory on it, that, that's got to mean something a little bit extra special, getting a pole position at Road America with his remembrance. Yeah, it's very special uh, to carry um, that logo in uh, memory of Dave. Um, we had a special moment last weekend in England with uh, one of his championship cars, the GT1 Evo. Um, so we're thinking of them, um, but a uh, special celebration today uh, to back up uh, Lime Rock. You know, we, we, we left Lime Rock pretty dejected. Uh, there were some unforeseen circumstances in the final stint that uh, were outside of the team's control. So I've been feeling for the guys and uh, just said every single session that we would uh, just put our, our foots uh, down on the ground and uh, look ahead. And uh, here we are. But just like I said at Lime Rock, the race is another thing. And to race here at Road America is another thing entirely from Lime Rock because we go from the shortest track on the schedule to the longest one. You just hoping for a green race tomorrow the whole way through, just run away and hide and hand it over to Christina? Yeah, that would play well for our strategy. Um, we're playing track position. Um, some of the others are doing a, a different strategy. But, you know, that's the modern day GT3 racing and uh, the modern GTD in uh, IMSA. It's everybody's race. Uh, it's so tight. Uh, we were able to really string together uh, probably the best lap of the weekend right before the red flag. So that was timely and uh, something that we uh, feel fortunate. But um, yeah, we went to ho we went to work last night. Uh, we came back with a completely different setup today. And uh, yeah, hats off to Bobby V. Uh, uh, young Bob Viglioni is a huge talent. He's a, as an engineer I've been working with for the uh, last four years and uh, really, really enjoy working with him. He's a cool customer. I'm not always cool uh, under the collar. So uh, it's great to have somebody on the the, the radio and uh, tuning your car that that is always even keeled it's not your fault if you're not always cool under the collar it's a red hair you can't help who you are road america porsche why did the two always go so well together yeah i don't know the bratwurst i i honestly um the 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 length of this track and the length of the straights um is is what you first think of but actually it's a very technical racetrack uh, a lot of the corners um, have different surfaces, so it becomes very technical and uh, direction change efficient, sort of short wheelbase uh, rear engine 911 attributes work well here, but uh, I'll keep saying it, uh, 40 minutes into the stint, you're gonna see uh, different cars with different performance strengths and weaknesses, and uh, then you add strategy to it, so uh, it's gonna be a long day ahead, but a good one for the fans. Which is why we love it. Good luck tomorrow to the Wright Motorsport number 58 Porsche. Thanks, Shay. Patrick Long there talking to Shea Adam and a, a considered driver, one of the best road races America has produced in recent years. Uh, Dave Mirage, the man behind Champion Motorsport, Porsche and Audi racer par excellence, uh, remembered on a number of the cars this weekend with decals. 
tragically uh, lost his life a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we we men remember him. Come, came over from the the uh, Caribbean, where he was a decent rally driver actually, and liked to drive in his own right. Built up champion, Dave Mirage built up champion as the uh, world's biggest Porsche dealer. Raced Audis in terms of volume. Raced Audis in the early days, uh, including Mike Peters raced an Audi for champion here. Mike Peters is long time team manager and strategist for a number of teams. This weekend is with Mazda Team Yost in the WeatherTech Championship. I remember them the first year I came over here. By then they were running the GT1 Evo for the 911 for a certain Alan McNeish and Ralph Kellerness. And that multicoloured rainbow livery becoming a fan favourite and they were very good at even in the early days of making those making that livery uh, glow in the dark for Petit Le Mans. Our condolences to the whole champion family, and by that I don't just mean the relatives of Dave Mirage, but the champion family is large, broad, and throughout motorsport, and there's a lot of them here in this paddock. Green flag for GT Le Mans, and out go the two Chevrolet Corvettes immediately. Oh, headlights have just gone off on the number three car. Saving power. Saving power, okay, if you say so. Uh, Shea Adam will give us the uh, qualifying drivers. I can tell you that it was Antonio Garcia and Oli Gavin in respectively the three and four who sneaked out behind you, Shea. Who else will be qualifying in GT Le Mans? You're still in some of my thunder there, John. Sorry about uh, that. No, it's okay. Um, as a proud member of the champion family, I will tell you the Porsches first. It is Lawrence Van Tour and the number 912 Porsche. So he will be starting the race for the Porsche GT team. And it is Nick Tandy in the number 911 Porsche. In the BMW world, it is Alexander Sims in the number 25 and Yessi Krohn in the 24. Yessi won this race a year ago in GTD with Turner Motorsports and Alex has only raced here once, but he does not have a pole position to his name yet, I say. Uh, there's the 912 firing up in the 911. They're going out together as well, so clearly Corvette doing two by two. Porsche's picked up on that strategy. And in Ford land, it has been Dirk Mueller on pole for the last two years in a row in GTLM at this track. He's gonna try and make it three in a row, but his teammate, Ryan Briscoe, is going to try and stop him from doing that. Those Porsches sound remarkable. Remarkable as they're being accelerated away from the pit lane speed limit. They don't sound like any other Porsche. Quite brilliant noise that they make. Changed the exhaust a, a couple of seasons ago going into Le Mans. I seem to remember it on the airfield opposite Le Mans. And I honestly thought it was a prototype that was running around there on the uh, was it Tuesday or the Wednesday night, maybe. No, it must have been the uh, Monday or the Tuesday night for Wednesday practice. Prototypes coming into pit lane, getting ready for their 15 minutes of fame and glory. But it's the GT Le Mans cars. Four manufacturers, two cars each, 15 minutes on the clock. Michelin tyres, which we know can last the whole 15 minutes. And in the last couple of qualifying sessions, it's gone pretty much to the wire. So... First to go across and start a flying lap. Tonio Garcia through the first corner. The right-hander, quick. Get the car balanced down the hill. Pick your braking point and get turned into that apex. You take a slightly late apex there and drift all the way over the kerb on the left-hand side on the exit. Then point the car to the right-hand side of the Sargento bridge. Just easing it gently through this long, curving right-hander. Then to the left, just as you go over the top of the brow, 160, 170 miles an hour at least before braking to the downhill left-hander that is turn five. Get the Michelin tyres right onto the concrete that sits behind the kerb, then up under the Corvette bridge to turn six. You have to turn in here just before you can see the apex of the left-hander. There is a little bit of run up there. Turn seven, it's got a slight bank to it, and you can use that in the middle of the corner to take as much much pace down the hill as possible. Ollie Gavin in the number four car following at a respectful distance from his teammate. Brakes 
to turn into turn number eight. Another corner that has concrete behind the curb and you use it, then balance the car into the carousel, turning nice and early. Very, very steady throttle through there until you see the exit curb. Aim it effectively at the Continental tyre, left-hand bridge abutment as you come out of there. Then through the kink. Oh, that was flat for Bolly Gavin through the kink there on his first flyer. That's not a kink, it's a corner. It is a proper corner, yes. You're absolutely right. Down into Canada corner, down through the gearbox. Much quicker than it looks on the track map, and you take plenty of speed through there. Now, from now on, you're climbing. Turn 13, very much uphill, and if you get half a car's width offline, the camber takes you away from where you want to be. Into the final corner. Garcia already up the hill. Oli Gavin all the way out using all of the asphalt on driver's left. On the exit of the corner, yes, but not curiously, on the on the entrance of the yes, corner. Yes, correct. He, he left put the better part of the car width on the left-hand side of the, of the track there, which is uh, interesting to watch. The uh, benchmark time this weekend, by the, uh, by the way, at 2 minutes 2.943. That was set this morning by Jesse Krohn in the number 24 BMW. The lap record set last year by Dirk Mueller in the 4 GT 201.422, a whole second and a half faster than anything we've seen so far this weekend. And I'll guarantee you we won't see that in the first two, three, possibly even four laps. What we've seen this year, Jeremy, is very much a, well, not a waiting game, but certainly being patient in bringing the Michelin tyres up to pressure and temperature on all of the GT Le Mans cars, people working up to their fastest lap. And that's not because they're not, don't know where they're going here. That's very much a function of the tyres that they've got on the car. What that has led to is 15 minute sessions that have run all the way to the end. This is a long lap here. And we're only gonna see what, probably six, seven laps at pace from these cars. 2.030 is the first representative lap time and it goes to the Ford number 66 of Dirk Muller. Everyone else in the fives, sixes or slower. Yeah, to give you an idea, Tony Garcia, who was first out of the pits at 2.083 last time around. And that was his second flying lap. The number six car's best lap of the weekend, or number either of the Ford's best lap of the weekend so far, was a 2034. So already has found four tenths of a second, his first flying lap in qualifying. And there's more to come. Oh, yes. I, I think we might see a 201. I really do. It, it's, it's clouded over a tiny little I'm bit. I'm surprised there's if there isn't. Yeah. We, you worked out that there was a 2018, I think, didn't you? If, if the. No, I didn't actually. I didn't know that was uh, that was something different. I think. All right. But uh, but the lap record was a 201.4 uh, last year, so I'd be surprised if they weren't close to that. Really, it's, it's quite warm this afternoon, certainly. It has just actually. been a little bit of cloud cover in the last half yeah. an hour, so we haven't got quite as strong shadows. It's by no means cold. Don't let me mislead you on that here at Road America. We're live on IMSA Radio. <laughs> And IMSA TV together from trackside, sound and vision. 912 Porsche through the kink, Lawrence Van Tour. Congratulations to the Van Tours expecting their first child. Lawrence and Jacqueline. Lawrence very excited about that. Heading, oh, gets a big wiggle over the bump where the tunnel is between 13 and the final corner at 14 now the screaming flat six of the Porsche 911 RSR heads up the hill past us and across the line and Vanto goes up into second position yeah. two or three one and Dirk Muller did improve on that last lap of two or two five so that is the best lap of the weekend so far that's number 66 Ford but he didn't he wasn't as quick as he was in his previous lap in the final sector of the lap so we lost a bit of time in those final couple of corners Nick Tandy's had a slap on the wrist his second flying lap's been invalidated and that leaves him down in sixth position it's the turn one exit that's causing both of the Porsche's problems and a drive through earlier on for the 912 in the hands of Lawrence Van Tour now it was Lawrence and uh, Earl Bamba, who both transgressed 
the line there earlier on in the weekend. Can't afford to be losing laps here. And Nick Tandy was in sixth, is now down in eighth and hasn't beaten the Porsche GT Daytona time yet. And Pat Long, but he's on a quicker one now, but it's not going to be quick enough. Dirk Muller, another fast first sector, also looking to improve. Jesse Krun in the black number 24, Mission Impossible 8. The, oh, and he's off at the final corner and somehow manages to save it. My goodness, how did he hold on to that? Right over the edge of the kerb with the left rear Michelin tyre, and he's lifted off, and that's cost him time. He was on a great lap there, but he does not improve, and that's caught his attention. Tandy is on a good lap. Muller on a very good lap. There's a low 202 here, Jeremy. 35.5, then under 50 seconds in sector two. He's got clear road. The Ford crests the brow. Here comes the number 66 across the line now. It is a better time, a 202, 479. He's found almost a tenth there, but he hasn't been able to do as good sector times in sectors two and three as he's done in the past. So there is a better time out there for Dirk Muller if he can string it together. No improvement from Van Tour last time around. Nick Tandy does improve, 203, 6. And gets that lap allowed. That's his fourth time around. Ryan Briscoe improves for Ford. The 67 comes up in the third position with a 2027. Ollie Gavin was in third. He just put in a 2031, but he's bumped back down. That's his best lap. There's a lot of light colours on the timing screen. Three minutes to go. What have you got in the fast draw? If there's anything less there now, get it out, throw it at the track. Rumbling Corvette goes past us. That's Tonio Garcia. No improvement there. 202, 746 he had. 792 he's done. Muller off it. Muller's not going to improve this lap. He has got time to get around and do one more if he wants to. Two tenths of a second between first and second. Fractions of a second between second and third. 202746 Garcia, 202753 for Briscoe. Tandy on another good lap, but not as good as Alexander Sims in the 25 BMW. And Jesse Grant has pulled himself together, cooled his tires a little bit, and then goes for it in the final sector, and has got a really good run down the start, finish straight in the 24 BMW that was looking so quick until the very final corner. That's very frustrating for Chrome, but he's got his head back together again as Dirk Muller goes through. Yeah, but even with that lap, he's still uh, losing three or four tenths of a second in the first sector on this lap. Ryan Briscoe is on a better one here. So is Tony Garcia. Right there at turn 13. Very tight between Tony Garcia and Ryan Briscoe. They're both improving. They need to find almost three tenths to challenge Dirk Muller. Still a minute and a half to go. Alexander Sims did a 2.03.6, his best time last time around for BMW 25, but he still sits in seventh, just over a second between first and eighth. That's the field spread. Right. Briscoe to second. Yep. Can Garcia fight back? So it's a Ford front row at the moment. Chip Ganassi's boys. Through goes the 25 of Alexander Sims. Here comes Garcia. Does he improve and claim back the front row spot? He does not. Ollie Gavin goes through and starts what will be his final lap. Waiting for Nick Tandy now. Coming down towards turn seven for the affable Brit. Yeah, this is going to be the final opportunity for Nick Tandy. He's yes, it uh, is. eighth and last at the moment, which is a surprise. He's only, uh, he's about, what, four tenths slower than Lawrence Van Tour, his teammate, but this is going to be his final opportunity because the chequered flag is going to be out in 15 seconds time. Through the carousel for, Can for Tandy now and heading towards the kink. Will not like having the big number eight on the side of his car on that LED display. No doubt the Porsche has been quick and competitive 
in the last few races, but they haven't been able to get the performance when they need it. Checkered flag is being waved. So this is Nick Tandy's last chance as he gets onto the brakes and turns right at Canada Corner, gets a bit of a slide in the middle of the corner. That's cost him time. He was on a decent lap, but nothing spectacular. Yeah, nothing spectacular. He only needs to find it. His well, teammates. he needs to find three tenths to get into the top six. Yeah. His teammate is on a better lap, however, Lawrence Van Tour. Correct. Van Tour will cross the line, line first. He's just gone through. Van Tour moves up one position and he's on the outside of row two as it stands. Dirk Muller into the pit lane. He'll not improve on his 2024. I don't think he needs to. Ryan Briscoe already in the pit lane. Ford locking out the front row of IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship qualifying for GT Le Mans. Nick Tandy also realised he wasn't going to improve, no. so he also brought the number 911 car onto pit lane. So it's going to be that 202.479 that's going to get to be good enough for the pole position. It's a whole second away from last year. I'm surprised that they're that far off. Quite it's got to be a little bit warmer. That's all I can yeah. think of, Jeremy. And in fairness, Muller had all three sectors. Yeah. Is the 24 of Jesse Kron going to improve from its sixth position at the moment? Tony Garcia is off the pace. He's touring back in, but Jesse Kron was really leaning on it through the kink. He's now at Canada Corner, lays two big black lines of Michelin rubber coming out of there. It's spectacular, but is it quick? Through 13, uses all of the exit there, squares the car up for the final right-hander. At turn 14, a little bit of understeer as he turned into there, which will have cost him time getting on the throttle, and that will really hurt him going up the hill. The car just pushing from the centre of the corner out across the line, and Krohn does not improve. 203861, he's been half a second quicker than that. Well, not for the want of trying there for Jesse Krohn, but Dirk Muller with three purple sector times meaning he was the quickest in all three sectors of the circuit and the only person who improved at the last knockings there was Lawrence Van Tour up into fourth Ford Ford Chevrolet Corvette and Porsche the front two rows of the grid and separated by half a second on four miles and what 122 second lap so the whole field within 1.2 seconds on a 122 second lap so gives you an idea of how competitive that is it looks like a big gap between first and eighth Nick Tandy but you can't say Nick was hanging around or Alex Sims or Jesse Krohn or Oli Gavin in the bottom half of that top eight our second pole setter of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship qualifying live here on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV and it is Dirk Muller who has Pulled the car up, Jeremy. First, first time this year for Dirk Mueller wow. to be on the pole. And Shea Adam is waiting for the Chip Ganassi Ford USA driver. Shea? Well, I can do you one better stat than that, John. Every time we come to Road America in a Ford GT, it's Dirk Mueller who gets the pole position. It just seems to happen that way. 2016, 2017, Dirk, 2018 pole sitter. How do you keep doing this? Well, no pressure. Um, just got to information from Joey and um, you know Mama Hand was telling telling me some pressure so I had to do it <laughs> no um, seriously it's a whole team effort I mean it's it's a complete different track right now it's a lot warmer and we knew it from the get-go so for Chip Ganassi Racing they're doing such an awesome job I keep saying that but all the smart brands behind us they are really really strong and I knew I mean I kind of really love this place like Joey um, I'm German I love the notch lifers so a lot of these corners are like the notch life uh, and um, yeah, um, good start for tomorrow, but um, we need to keep digging down. But uh, Joe and I, we, we love this track. The 66 for GT is fast around here and um, our boys are fast in the pit stops, so we're looking forward. How important is it for your championship lead defending that coming in here to get the first starting position? <laughs> I mean, it's always good to start first, but um, you know the, the race is still long, so you need to really make a zero mistake um, race. We have been zero mistake so far, the whole team, and I'm pretty sure we are doing that tomorrow. Um, you know, we were taking weekend by weekend, and then we'll see what, what comes out at the end. Um, that's how we approach the, the season this year. It's working good so far, and uh, yeah, keep digging down. Well, since your podium at uh, June over in Lamar, it's been a win every weekend for Ford Chip Ganassi Racing. Good luck keeping the streak going. Yeah, we will. We give it all.
This is the year eighth race of the season for the GTLM category in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. We've had eight different pole sitters now in, in terms GTLM. of the drivers. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Very good, very good indeed. And that that uh, stat that Shea mentioned there, since they came back after Le Mans, and the championship challenge starts at the sail in six hours of the Glen. We've often said this because the race has come thick and fast in the second half of the season. And this is where you can either cement your championship challenge or see it wither on the vine. And certainly it's been the former here as far as the Pod Chip Ganassi team goes coming in this weekend on the championship point. But it's course, Jeremy. I mean, we're talking about him coming in uh, with a championship lead, but the top, what, four crews within the point swing of, of, I think it's 12 points, isn't it, between first and eighth in GT Le Mans. That's how the points work. And how many crews have we got in a 12-point swing? Oh, um... Top four? Yeah, top, top four, yeah. 11, yeah. 11 points covering the, the, uh, the top four. So by no means are we Just handing uh, out any trophies no, yet. No, exactly. No, it's a one-point lead for Joey Hand and Dirk Mueller over Jan Magnussen and Antonio Garcia. And then the second of the Fords, Richard Westbrook and Ryan Briscoe, they're just one point further back in third. So super tight there. The it's manufacturers, the Porsche, isn't it, that's next up? Yeah, but the yeah. Manufacturers' Championship, uh, Ford's got a pretty good uh, advantage there. They've got an 11-point lead now over Chevy. As a result, as Shea was saying, of three wins in a row the last three races. Prior to that, uh, actually, Porsche had two wins and one apiece for Ford and Chevrolet. But that now that's turned around with four wins for Ford, uh, one for Chevy and two for Porsche. Now, so, yes, now this is going to be fun. If you are trackside, you might want to take half a step back <laughs> uh, for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, if you are of a nervous disposition, look away now for <laughs> 15 minutes. Ollie Jarvis is qualifying the 77. I saw him getting into that car but I didn't see who got into the 55 but Cher Adam will tell us in this Continental Tire Pitler Report who our other prototype qualifying drivers are. Harry Tinknell, first ah. time to Road America, has been given the honours of qualifying the number 55 Mazda. His teammate Jonathan Bomarino has put a Mazda on the overall pole here before, so I'm a little interested as to why they're giving Harry the responsibility. It's a lot of pressure on his shoulders. For the number 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac, that will be Eric Curran. And Joao Barbosa, coming back to the series, he gets to drive the Mustang sampling number five. It is the bright yellow helmet of Ranger Van de Zanda in the number 10, the Iconic Minolta DPI Cadillac, and that will be a car to keep a casual eye on as well. And it has been Colin Brown, who has been mm. the pole sitter in that number 54 core Autosports Orica. He is behind the wheel, so he will be doing the qualifying duties for that car. Juan Montoya in the number six Penske Acura will be going out to battle against Ricky Taylor, birthday boy, it, well, from yesterday at least, in the number seven, the sister car. And it's Robert Alon in the number... 85 JDC Miller Motorsports Orica. Uh, should be Misha Goikberg in the 99. I'm all the way down on the other end of pit lane, so I must confess I can't actually see those cars. Uh, Scott Sharp was going to be doing the qualifying in the number two, and that's as far as I can walk without sounding terribly out of breath, John. Well, uh, where's the who's in the 22? I don't know. That's right across from you. If oh it's yes, an orange it helmet, it's Jojo, Johannes Van Overbeck. Um, if it's an orange and white and blue helmet, it would be Pippo Durrani. Of course, he's got the door open, but there's not enough light in the helmet. I think it might be Pete Bordurani. Well, by the time I get down there, he'll have left, but I'll try anyway. Okay. It looks like a multicolored helmet with some orange on it, which would make it people. Um, but I, I reserve uh, I reserve judgment until I get a better look. Jeremy's having a peer over yeah, the top of our screen. Kind of head rest of the cars. Yeah, there, exactly. Exactly. Uh, definitely Scott Sharp in the number two car. Yeah, and he's been fast this oh, weekend. He's been rapid. Both, both guys have been quick in that car. Actually, Ryan Diel has uh, set the uh, best lap of the uh, weekend for that team at a 52.3. Second quickest overall. The fastest lap of the weekend set this morning. Very impressive. 151.644. The lap record uh, is a 53.0. So uh, a second and a half underneath that for Simon Trummer 
in number 85, Orica for JDC Miller Motorsports. So 15 minutes will be put on the clock. And if we've learned anything in the 2018 season is that pretty much anything can happen in that quarter of an hour. The green flag is in the air and it's Van Overbeck. It is Van Overbeck, not Tirani, that is in the 22 car. I could see a bit of orange, but I couldn't tell what was on the rest of the helmet. And it's Gustavo Jakerman in the yellow and red number 52 who will be taking to the track. Almost anything can happen and often does. Eric Curran was in the 31, the red and white wheel and car at that team racing with somewhat heavy hearts this weekend. John Olsen, one of the great leaders of the Whelan team and the Whelan uh, concern. Not too great a statement to say that he's changed the face in the 50 odd years that he's been involved with Whelan, changed the face of emergency lighting and uh, sadly died this week that team racing very much in his honour. Right hand man, Sonny Whelan, at the start of the Whelan concern. Eric Curran on qualifying duties today for that car. By the way, the, that lap this morning by uh, Simon Trummer, it was uh, an average speed of over 130 miles an hour. Wow. It's been a while since we've seen that. I mean, th there have been 130 mile la laps around here before, Indy cars certainly, but uh, also th the outright lap record here for sports cars was set by Lucas Lure. I've got a note here, back in uh, 2008. That would have been Is in the... the no, 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 that would be the muscle milk car, wouldn't it? I'd have thought so, but... I will let you have a look at that. Come on. Do carry on as the cars get up Talk to... Talk yourselves. Yes. Answers on the postcard, please, do. Right, across the line, Eric Curran. Down towards the first corner. He's got clear track ahead of him. Behind him, if he was to just crane his neck, he would see the very glossy black Cadillac number 10. Then, it's the 99 coming through, bright red. Then Colin Brown in the Tangerine black and white car. Then the first of the ESM Nismo powered cars is the 22 of Johannes van Overbeck. Yeah, Lucas Leo was driving Brown then. Was he? Yeah. Right, my apologies. With magic, so that was magic, so that would be an R10. Pardon? Was that an R10? R10, R10 to the R10, yes. R10, yes. yes. That was probably the last year before they started getting wound back, wasn't it? Yes, I think so. End up he won the race also with Marco Werner. Magic Marco. Unusual that Ma Marco wasn't qualifying. Yes, well, that's, uh, that's how he got that nickname extraordinary run of pole positions he had Colin Brown is the man with the pole run going at the moment has really got the handle on the number 54 core Autosport prototype now these guys will be going at it straight away so I expect to see a fast lap come with within the first couple or three laps quite a, a different story here with these cars, with the additional downforce, they get the energy into the tyres very quickly indeed. And you have to strike while the tyres are at their very best. We're talking such fine margins here that even at half a percent difference in the potential of the performance of the tyre, the drivers will feel it and the stopwatch will show it, or at least the timing equipment to suggest that what Al Camel are doing is stopwatches at the moment. I'm sorry, I'll take that back immediately, ladies and gents. Far more sophisticated than that, but you get the general idea. Already five minutes in before Eric Curran puts in a 53-5, but then a 53-2 by Colin Brown. He's just working up to one, I think. Misha Goikberg in third with 54s and 55s for Van Overbuck and Beck and 
Franka van der Zander, a 57 in the number 10 Cadillac. Gibson power for the for all of the global P2 cars. All of the cars with the same basic chassis, one of four manufacturers allowed. But the manufacturer, the DPI cars, having free choice of a manufacturer engine, different bodywork, different suspension, and crucially, traction control, which the P2s don't have. See, the suspension makes a big difference as well. Freedom with dampers. Across the line for the 55. You listen carefully, you can hear the turbo twittering on the Mazda as Harry Tinkle goes up into third and you can also hear that car bottoming out. It's been run very, very low indeed for this qualifying session. So try to optimise the aero, get the car as close as the to the ground as you can to help with the aerodynamic efficiency. That's a very good middle sector for uh, Renga van der Zander. 45.4 seconds, that's about as quick as Simon Trummer went this morning, but uh, he was, he's got about a half a second to find in the first sector if he's going to ma match that 51 sixth that was set earlier. But it's, as uh, you heard from uh, Dirk, Dirk Muller, it's a lot hotter this afternoon yes than it, it was is. this morning. Ollie Jarvis was very quick in the middle sector as well in the early practice sessions as Renge van der Zander and Juan Montoya are starting to get down to business now. 52 9 from Colin Brown, who splits them. Montoya had done a 53 flat. 52, the first into the 52, so it's Renga van der Zander and then Colin Brown. There's half a second between them, 52-4 and a 52-9 for respectively the Cadillac and the Orica with the Acura in third position. And Schwab Barbosa still suffering a little bit with a wrist that is still needs a, a little bit of support, having broken it on his bicycle. He's up into fifth position. Half a second between the top four near enough. For Ollie Jarvis's time to drop in. Nice. Look, I think looking for a bit of space on the circuit. 156.3 for Ollie. There goes the 55 of Harry Tinknell. He jumps up to eighth position with a 153.6, but Ollie yet to put in a time anywhere near as quickly as we've seen. That number 77, Mazda going early in the week. Through goes the number seven of Ricky Taylor on what is his first flying lap and he goes straight to the top of the timing screens with a 52-1. Now we're talking. Ricky Taylor in a different car on pole position here last year has now got a three-tenths advantage on everyone else. There's Montoya passing us and he jumps back to third. 52-7. Four cars under 153. Watch this lap there from uh, Robert Alon. He's on a good lap here in Canada. Just gone through and he goes to Paul. 52 flat. Nearly into the 51s. 52-048. Robert Alon loves this place. Was mighty here in Prototype Challenge a few years ago. Won here in 2016. 0 0.092 of a second between himself and Ricky Taylor. 52-048. Now the new benchmark. He was second on the front row of the grid last time out at Canadian Time Motorsport Park with Robert Alon. 52 uh -oh. with problems for Jakobin. He's going to make it to the pit lane. He's got a left rear puncture. Jakobin right at the end of a lap. He had a decent middle sector there as well. Meantime, the number seven of Ricky Taylor coming through the kink and now down towards Canada Corner. Bottoming out as he breaks into that right-hander, trying to make, take as much speed through as he can, getting back onto the track surface just before the runoff runs out. Takes the apex to the left-hand side of turn 13, now squaring himself up for the final corner. Nice late apex on the power, beautifully early. This is another good lap, I think, from Ricky Taylor. Wasn't quite as quick as he has been in the middle sector. Is he, is he going to find 0 0.092 of a second? Needs to find a tenth. No, he doesn't. Loses a tenth. As Jakobin struggles up to his pit with the left rear that is less than primo. But watch for Robert Alon. He uh, he went. Uh, the quick one. He, yeah, he's on um, a, a 
significantly quicker one by a couple of three tenths if he can uh, keep this up through these final few corners. Robert Alon in the bright yellow number 85. Here he comes. Here he across, comes. The line. across the line now. And the time flickers up in front of us. It's a 51 9. Lost a little bit of time in the final sector, but it was still an improvement. Two first tenths of a time, second now. First time then in the 51s in qualifying in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship era. Fastest lap that we've seen. That's Colin Brown. In qualifying then for. Colin Brown does improve, a 52.3. Rather surprised we haven't seen a little more from the Mazdas, particularly Ollie Jarvis. He was going great goods. He's going to improve here. Eighth position for the 55, seventh for. Uh, eighth position for the 55 for the 77, seventh position for the 55. But yes. Ollie's on a decent lap here. Yeah, but both of them are they're, they're, they're half a second down in the, the first, first sector. sector. Yeah. They've been good in the middle sector, Jeremy. Yes. Particularly Ollie. And he just goes That's past us drives. now. Should for the time to improving. update, he just leapfrogs Joao Barbosa. So he's up into the top six for that 77 car. Four minutes exactly to go. Here's the 55. Harry Tinknell following his teammate around at the moment. He does not improve. So it's the 85 bright yellow Orica that w is leading by two tenths of a second from Ricky Taylor in the number seven Acura. Who's not on a quick lap. From Colin Brown in third in the white and tangerine Orica Gibson, who is on a good lap. He's about a tenth down on Alon at the moment, but if he can hold that, he will get on the front row. Through goes the six, Juan Montoya. The engine of the Acura just not sounding like it's being pushed anywhere near as hard as the others as it goes through. Very different sound, a lower thrum to the Acura motor. Eric Curran comes through, ninth at the moment, stays ninth. Colin Brown. Decent middle sector, but nothing spectacular. Into the pit lane for Robert Alon with three minutes to go. They are done. A 151.9. That's their final bid here. Here comes the Gibson engine 54. No improvement for Colin Brown either. No. That's a He's feather have one more lap. Alon, isn't it? One more lap. Alon has two of the best sector times. First and third. Not too shabby in the middle. Simon Trommer, by the way, was three tenths quicker in a final sector this morning. It's not relevant, but interesting. But it is a lot warmer this afternoon. That was a great lap by Robert Alon. It really was. Harry Tinknell yes, too wide. Two of them, didn't he? Yeah, two laps quicker than anybody Correct. else. Harry Tinknell too wide at turn one and will lose a lap. That's affected him. No, it hasn't. Staying in eighth position as Colin Brown explores the exterior of the circuits and the outer limits. He was uh, very close to the edge on a couple of corners. Coming out of uh, the final corner before he started this lap. Riding the curves aggressively before heading up the hill. He's down at turn number eight now. Gets a slide on there. The wear plank on the floor, floor clattering against the track surface. Car's fairly softly sprung because it is quite a bumpy surface here. So you need compliance, but you do want to keep the car as close to the ground as possible. It looks like Brown has lifted off. Colin Brown has lifted off and stays out of the way as the ESM goes by him. Maybe he has, yeah, he has time for one more. The two Nismos at the bottom of the times at the moment. 12th and 13th and spins. That's a spin coming out of Canada corner. Just gone past Robert, uh, excuse me, uh, Colin Brown. And the 22 of Johannes van Overbeck is in the tyres, having gone too wide at Canada Corner and looped it back around. Just just sort of brushed the tyres there, perhaps, with the uh, side of the car. Did a complete loop around it, 180 degrees around, but I don't think there's any damage to that car. But surprisingly, he's slowest of all here, Jens van Overbeck. The two, the two Nissans at the back of the pack. And we've seen better times from those cars earlier on in the week. 53s and 54s, they've been quicker than that, Jeremy. They were doing a lot of work on the cars in the last practice session. And I thought it was fine tuning, particularly for the number two, because that car had been very quick indeed. But clearly not. Maybe they were no. fighting something that we weren't aware of. 
Van Overbeck losing it very early on the exit. Didn't actually drop off the circuit as I thought he might do. And there was a collision with the tyres. Yeah, so Last for 10 seconds. For Colin Brown, it's not going to be three poles in a row. Then he's uh, one that got the pole position each of the last two races. Then the, the team elected to start from the back in the race. Look at who's got this set, the fastest second sector. Ricky Taylor in the Team Acura Penske car. Scott Sharp's done his work for the day as the chequered flag comes out. Who's still out on track? Harry Tinknell seeing the chequered flag. So Ollie Jarvis is on his final lap. Didn't see the chequered flag. We'll know when he gets down to the braking area for turn five if he's likely to improve and therefore whether he'll continue with the lap. Turn one, he was very wide indeed and got a big wiggle on and, oh, Air Jarvis for a while. So I'd be surprised if he's Delta, if the, uh, the time on his dashboard gives him any kind of encouragement at all it hasn't and he'll back out of it has already done so in fact so thank you van der Zander. no not on a quick one so robert alon continues his good form jdc miller motorsport yeah. continue wow. their good form as well yeah we've had uh, this will be the with the eighth race of the uh, prototype season We've had seven different pulses. The only repeat pulse that it was Colin Brown the last two races. But what a feather in the cap here for Robert Alon. That was a great lap by the Californian. He's got some very experienced, very fast, very savvy racing drivers behind him in this qualifying session. It had four poles to his name in the uh, P2 category, but this is his first pole in the prototypes. And that really is a great effort. I mean, his teammate Simon Trummer was fastest this in, morning. In PC. So PC. What did I say? P2. P2. Okay, but but yeah, I know why you're thinking Prototype that, because challenge. Pro yeah. P2 is PC next yeah, year, effectively. True. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Bailing me out. Uh, yes, so, I mean, he loves this place. He's been quick here every time he's been here, yeah. other than when he had a roof over his head in the Lexus. Uh, but I'll, I'll let him forget about that one. We'll give him a pass on that. When he's had downforce, he's been very fast here. And he'll get the call in a moment to trundle that number 85 car down towards Shea Adam. And we'll have our final Continental Tire pit lane report of this session and our third pole sitter. Misha Goigberg very happy with the situation standing on the pit wall watching his teammate. And Robert just talking to the team over the radio. Got his visor up at the moment. In comes Ollie Jarvis. He'll start sixth. So it will be Orica. Gibson on pole position, the 85 car. Ricky Taylor for Acura Team Penske on the outside of row number two with the seven car. Uh, row number one on, with the seven car. On row two, Colin Brown has his two pole streak broken, but will still start from the inside, but the inside of row two this time in the 54 core Autosport, Orica Gibson. Frank maybe. Van der yes, maybe. Good point. Um, Frenge van der Zander, as they have qualified, is on the outside of row two with the number 10. And it's the best of the Cadillacs by ooh, half a second. Row yeah. three, Juan Montoya on the inside in the sixth, the second of the Acura Team Penske car. Oli Jarvis is the best of the Mazdas on the outside. And we're getting towards a second away from Paul here. Spread out more than one would expect, but this is a long track. Pretty low-key character, Robert. It'll be interesting to see what his uh, what his reaction is when he when he gets to speak with very much Shea Adam very, very shortly. Car engine comes, uh, car comes to a halt, and the engine is turned off. Opens the left-hand side door, and Shea Adam, with our Continental Tire Pitlane report, will give us our pole sitter for the Continental Tire Road Race Showcase here at Road America for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Going to give him a couple minutes to get his head sock off and uh, his earplugs out. Fifth pole position for Robert Alon, career-wise. First one that he'll be starting from the front of the field with uh, just himself to, to follow because, of course, back in the PC category, he was not leading them to the green flag. He was being led by the other prototype drivers. Let's get Robert to uh, come on over this way so we're not getting hit by race cars. Always a good thing. But he's, he's had much success in prototypes in the past, and 
Robert Alon driving with Simon Trummer. Robert, it's been a year where it's been so close. You and Simon have really become a good pairing working together. Starting from the front of the field, though, is that going to be the secret that finally gets you that elusive first win? I mean, honestly, I don't think posi starting position has been like a huge part of this year. It's been just putting together a good race, and I think as long as we do that, we're going to be good. I mean, whether we start first, second, or third, I don't think it's a big deal. It's just as long as everyone on the team does their job and we push forward, we're going we're gonna to be fine. How good was that lap, though? Uh, I mean, it was like my first flying lap, and it just, yeah, it felt right. Tire grip was there. And, like, after the first lap, I think tire, tire grip just fell off, and I think everyone got caught off guard. We, we prepared for that. We went low fuel, prepared for just a couple laps, and we kind of hit it right on. The team car has already gotten a win this year uh, with the 99. How much have they been able to help you guys this weekend in getting a good setup? Um, well, honestly, I think... It's uh, just to give credit to Simon and me and the, our engineer. We, we work together really well. We've been building throughout the year and last couple races we've been really quick and yeah, just come from, you know, good teamwork basically. Well, you got a win here in 2016 in a prototype, so good luck doing it again tomorrow. Thank you. Robert Alon, very yeah. matter of fact, giving credit where credit was due to Simon Trummer and the, the team. You can't do this on your own, Jeremy. We've said it many times before and uh, fair play, very classy along there to uh, acknowledge that yeah you're, you're absolutely right there and uh, ian and jeff willis there the two uh, two brothers lot from from toronto area in canada they're the uh, engineers or the brain trust behind the brady five car but uh, robert Lon, he, he's selling himself short there because that was a magnificent effort it really was i mean he qualified second at canadian time motorsport park i mean that place is not for the faint of heart and to put the car on the pole here at road america i i i want to see more excited than that because i thought it was a pr brilliant effort that was actually quite excited for uh, Robert Alon. Jeremy Shaw was in the booth next to me, John Hindoff, our Canada pit lane reporter was Shea Adam. The 58, Wright Motorsports, Porsche is on pole position in GTD. In GT Le Mans, Dirk Muller takes it for the 66 as Ford Chip Ganassi lock out the front row in the top GT class. And Robert Alon is on the front row for JDC Miller Motorsports in the yellow 85. That was qualifying. We'll see you for the race tomorrow. Bye-bye.